Kia ora koutou. hello everybody and welcome back to Epic Aotearoa Create a Better Future podcast. You've got just myself for this solo update, catch up, whatever you want to call it, uh, as the host for today. So myself, Joe Hortai, my co-founding partner, Mr. Brian Osman, is unable to be here with me today uh, due to work and other commitments that he has on. So diving into this quick update. We're just going to quickly recap on some of the stuff that happened prior to Christmas and what's come out or been released post Christmas, um, which many of you, if not all of you, have already seen or come across or stumbled across. And also just to thank everybody for the support from last year, from when we launched the podcast as of the 11th of June 2021 right through to where we are now. So really grateful for the support and also to wish you all happy new year on behalf of Brian Osman and myself. We wish you all a happy new year and we hope that 2022 is off to a fine start for everybody and that you're smashing whatever it is that you're smashing in a positive way, your goals or your projected forecasts in relation to business or health and fitness or whatever it is that you're looking to do. So. Anyway, that aside, um, welcome back. This update, hopefully it'll only take about 30 minutes or so, 30, 40 minutes. Um, so leading up to Christmas, obviously we had, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happened, but more in particular, we had a couple of the tactical response group guys from Australia, from Western Australia, uh, the incredible Todd Bowler and likely, likewise equally incredible Travis Hokart. Both of those guys, um, incredible, incredible people and doing amazing things. Uh, Todd with his home building solutions and Saw Consulting, as well as if you haven't already, check out his YouTube ch channel, Todd Bowler, and um, his train and learn and the stuff that he's doing there. So please head on over there. Please like, comment and subscribe and support him. Um, he's, he's doing some great work in that space with regards to sharing his experiences and lessons learned over more than 20 years, I think it was 23 years from memory, of service within the TRG. So a heck of a lot of uh, insights and knowledge and the ability to be able to communicate that information for people like you and I to be able to apply that, take it and apply it in positive ways in our own situation. Um, likewise, as I mentioned, the equally incredible Travis Hokart doing some amazing things with regards to not only the work that he does, but also um, the Kokoda Crossing business that he has so please head on over there and support that um, sounds incredible the stuff that they do if you haven't already have a listen to his podcast and the opportunity that we had or that Brian and I had and then myself to do the second part with him as he talks a lot more about what's been involved and all that sort of thing um, he was also a, an air marshal as well it's been funny speaking with or been really not only funny but interesting speaking with the guests and uh what you see in the videos, even though there's not much editing, if any editing that happens in them, yeah, it's a long time. And we'll address that. Brian and I are working on how we're addressing that. That's part of this update. But man, time seems to fly by just, just like that. Two, three hours literally seems like it's only been 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, and yeah, and, and I, we haven't figured out how to how to shorten that yet, but we have a plan and we're going to be looking to try to implement that um, with our next guest uh, coming up who I'll talk about. So some very interesting and unique lived experiences by some of the guests that we've had so far, and that's been incredible. We've also had the privilege of having a former uh, New Zealand SAS operator, Chris Kumaro, on the podcast. What a privilege it was to have that gentleman on, and uh, you would have seen and heard his podcast come out earlier this year probably within the first week i'm guessing of this new year 2022 so if you haven't head on over and check that out he's doing some incredible stuff as well and just the way he's wired to his culture to his roots of where he's from from the river and to aotearoa in general and trying to give back and serve and the things that he does so pretty incredible very amazing guy and it was a privilege to have the opportunity to connect with him Currently, right now, we've got, uh, as I look at my notes, we've got Danielle, Danielle Moffat, the wife of the legendary Harry Moffat. So he's a, he's a top man. Uh, he makes me laugh still with regards to the introduction that I gave him. And uh, he thanked me and said, you made me sound like a real wanker. So uh, um, that always puts a smile on my face when I, when I hear that because, um, yeah, it's not normal, I guess, for people within those areas to 
have usually a, a warm reception or welcome. Um, I didn't do it to to do that to Moff, but that's how he took it. And it was, but it's in lighthearted and good-hearted fun so anyway. So his wife is absolutely incredible. Was an amazing chance and opportunity for both Brian and I to sit down with her and to hear her story about the experiences from her side, operating on the home front looking after the children, raising the children, being the primary carer essentially for the most of their lives. And everything that comes with that whilst her husband has been away for a vast majority of that, looking after the children, needing to look after herself, continuing to work, maintaining the home, anything that comes up. And I would imagine being there for, other, for her family members and for her friends as well. <clears throat> so it was really impressive and awesome to spend time and share some space with her. Um, incredible to hear, you know, her experiences when her husband, when Moff uh, got injured in an IED that uh, they had driven over, or a landmine, one or the other, I can't remember now off the top of my head, uh, but yeah, pretty incredible in terms of her resilience and what she was able to do and has been able to do since then. So check out uh, Danielle and Moff's business, Stoughton Group. Uh, amazing work and what they're doing there as well and support them in any way that you can. And like they've mentioned, if you need to reach out or want to connect with them, jump on and connect with them at stoughtongroup.com.au. I hope that's right. I'll double check later and I'll add to the show notes of here. But a couple of amazing people. And so we've had them. And uh, coming up, well, this one's going to go up tomorrow and we've already completed or I, I had the opportunity to complete an interview, a conversation with a uh, New Zealand born Samoan gentleman uh, who went on to join the Australian Special Air Service. He was also part of uh, the TF here in Engineers here in NZ. I can't remember off the top of my head the name of the unit, but it's in the conversation anyway. And his name is Philip Tolele. He and his brother, his younger brother, George, <clears throat> both went on to serve in the Australian Special Air Service. Phil, Philip had already left before I got there, uh, but his brother George was still there, and he's a, he's a top man. George is out now. Um, he's been out for a while, and he's had his face and everything shown when they did the Australian, I think it was Search for Warriors or something like that, uh, on the Australian Special Air Service. So from what Philip told me, George had no problem with me mentioning his name. We spoke about George in the conversation anyway. But a couple of really cool guys. I haven't had the privilege to have George on the podcast yet, but hopefully we will. So, yeah, New Zealand-born Samoan lads, and uh, it was a great conversation. That conversation with Philip, warning order, went for over three hours. <clears throat> I think three and a half hours, maybe a bit more. And just sort of tying that back in, I broke that up. So just so that you know, it's into two parts, so about an hour 20-ish, thereabouts, uh, hour 15 each part, part one and two, just because we're mindful of and we're grateful for the feedback that we've received, verbal and email, podcast, great guys, but uh, it's a bit long, eh? <laughs> so we're going to try to work on that and we're aiming for that 45 minutes to an hour uh, mark is what we're going to try to hit going forward, but we apologize for... The previous ones we just haven't been able to keep it down to that and mind you to be fair we haven't really before now before like what we've identified now and what we're going to be trying to do we've not tried to limit it to an hour because when you're having people come on and you're trying to get their story or their experiences albeit a real brief snapshot <clears throat> that two three hours goes by like that as i mentioned and normally and what has happened with the majority of the guests that we've been fortunate enough to have on, we've continued, after I've hit, hit the stop button, we've continued talking for like another 30, 40 minutes, sometimes a bit longer. So in Bill Bestick's case in mine, once I hit stop, we had still been talking for like another 45 minutes before we actually hung up on each other and uh, like proper. And I just wished I had a kept the record button on because Bill delved into a whole bunch more um, of really relevant and helpful and useful information that I feel anyway it was for me and I know it would have been for our listeners and I just wish I had have left the record button on but um, I missed all of that <clears throat> and well our, our audience you guys missed all of that so apologies for that 
but that's just to give you, a, I guess, an insight or a context of what we've done in the past and how it has gone longer than, well, it's gone as long as it's needed to take because we've not set a time on it. But now that we've set a time or now that we're going to be trying to stick within a time frame of one hour, uh, it's going to be interesting. So we're planning and preparation and setting things up and sending them out to try to get stuff that we need, um, at least for that episode, condensed and jammed in so that our audience can benefit from it. <clears throat> so we haven't had that before. It might feel a little bit weird. It feels a little bit weird saying that now because it feels like Brian and I are going to be sort of restricting and limiting our guests, our special guests to a degree. But uh, having the conversations with them and letting them know that this is what we're trying to do and these are, these are the reasons why has so far, touch wood, been well received from them. So that aside, we've covered off on that. Just looking at my notes here, Danielle talked about the one hour, which we're trying to do. Oh, so this part, last two parts in this particular update. So Brian and I, I mentioned he sends his apologies and wishes everybody a happy new year. <laughs> we spoke about in one of our updates about we were making lighthearted fun about uh, unvaccinated and vaccinated people in relation to all this COVID hoo-ha that's happening around the place. <clears throat> and long story short, poor old Brian and members of his family have uh, contracted COVID. So his name, I, did, you know, I couldn't help myself but start needling him and, and jabbing him from afar through text messages and uh, voice messages and that sort of thing. So he went from Brian Osman to Brian Osmacron. And so I've had a bit of a laugh with him. Thankfully, him and his family are on the tail end of that. Well, actually, they're, they're doing really well. Um, he's working, but he's able to do a lot of his work from home, which is great as well. And so he's he's pretty much doing really well. And so, is, so are his family members that were diagnosed with the Omicron, Omnicron, whatever it is, Omicron, another con. So all those different, uh, these different coronaviruses and stuff that are out. So that's good news, but uh, funny how things sort of pan out. So just waiting for when it happens to me and maybe members of my family. So we'll see. But anyway, that aside, the Osmocron family are doing all right and I'm looking forward to connecting with him again on the, um, on the podcast. <clears throat> the last part of this here that I want to speak about, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the time, which is great. It's only been 12 minutes. Awesome is to do with some comments that were shared and I'll try and keep this as, as brief and as not divert or stray too much as I can in relation to Bill's, my conversation with Bill and some of his comments. All the feedback has been really positive, uh, not only of Bill's but of, of everybody's that we've had. There has only been one sort of uh, comment that I think was somebody either being genuine and sincere about their comments or just having a having a poke trying to poke the uh the beer so to speak in terms of their comment that they left but we had a laugh at it anyway so getting back to bill's comment or one of the comments that he mentioned during uh my conversation with him he spoke about when guys deploy uh and then they're getting ready to come back and once they've got that date to come back he goes oh, okay he mentioned, he said, okay, so should I call the families now and let them know that we're going to be coming back? And I believe from memory, because I haven't gone back and had a look, but then Bill was, he was told by somebody else or whoever it was that was part of that group, oh, no, no, don't don't call the families yet. Um, don't let them know, because what we'll do, you know, when we get back, they'll have some downtime sort of thing, whether that was 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever the case might be. And they'll go and have a few drinks and just unwind and settle before heading back to their families. And we received a number of uh, comments, thoughts from family members, from friends, and from um, current and former serving members of the respective units, not just the NZ one. And some really, really good points and sparked and triggered some uh, memories for me in terms of that particular piece of the conversation with Bill, because I didn't delve into it in a lot of detail. And some of the comments and thoughts and perceptions of, of individuals was, uh, and I'm just sharing the feedback that we received, some of them were perplexed by that mindset, and some, to be fair, they said that they were disappointed to hear that 
for whatever reason. And I'm not going to go into those with you here. That's very much their rights and their, their, um, yeah, their right to be able to have those thoughts and feelings about how it made them feel when Bill mentioned openly and honestly about that aspect of his experience on that part. I probably could have delved into it more with him in the conversation and then I might have been able to bring up some of the parts that I'll try to briefly touch on now. But I didn't. I did, for whatever reason, I didn't do that. Um, maybe I was just, maybe I was just not in the zone or not thinking much of it, or maybe I didn't think about it in the way that some of the feedback which we've received has come through. So maybe that was it. Because of my understanding of how some of that stuff works and why it's important and why it works for um, units like that. So just to try to give a little bit of uh, a different lens. So you had. The one lens where you heard Bill openly and honestly speak about, and correctly so, he spoke about from his view and his perspective of what happened in that situation. Um, and then this is just to give it another lens so that you can have maybe uh, an opportunity to, to see another side of the coin, so to speak. So <clears throat> having the opportunity to really connect and speak with the former members of, of the unit has been awesome. Um, and it's really been uplifting to hear that it's been helping uh, former members and current members to a degree. Um, it's It's been helping them in whatever way that's been helping, whether that's been mentally, whether that's been from a case of personal self-reflection or whatever it is. The feedback has been positive and we're really grateful for that. We're also mindful that myself, neither myself or the guests that we have on um, on the podcast, particularly this series in the service of others who dares wins, none of us speak for or on behalf of the SAS or the regiment as a unit itself. Like none of us do that. None of us are able to do that. All we're doing, all I'm doing, and all our guests and that are doing, which we're trying, which we hope is coming across, is purely sharing their perspectives and their opinions and their experiences because those are their experiences. We're in no way looking to try to say this is the unit's position when it comes to this and this. So that's if that has happened at any time, I don't think it has, but if it has, disregard it because neither I, like I said, or any of our guests speak for the unit or speak for the regiment. So what I will share is my take and maybe another lens, as I mentioned, on the reasons for why some of that... Um, transition for once of a better term or that delayed transition before they get home happens and in a nutshell <clears throat> as briefly as in as much of a nutshell as i can those uh those delays happen for a number of reasons and i'm just going to try to bullet point some of them one is that Sometimes, depending on the operation that they've just come back from, may have been quite intense, uh, may have exposed the operators to uh, a whole bunch of different things that have taken place. And that can take time to process. In some cases, it can take time to heal. <clears throat> and so by having and allowing some of that time to be back, it's not about just get on the gas and then go out and get up to mischief and then come back and then go to your family. That's not it at all. But unfortunately and sadly, some of the perception of, of the feedback that we received was taken that way. So here we're trying to give another lens. So all that stuff that may have happened on the operation can take some time to digest. That's one. Another aspect or two is that the guys may need time, and I use the term guys because they're... they're well, there wasn't and hasn't been any females in the patrols or in the unit whilst I was serving or whilst guys that I've spoken to, other former members have served either. So there may be issues that are that are that um, that had arisen during the operations, which you can't necessarily get right into as much depth or detail as you'd like to out on the task or out on patrol because it could potentially come to blows. And what I mean by that is potentially a punch-up could happen. And you're not about to and you don't want to be doing that out in the middle of the desert or wherever you are in those moments because you're relying on each other and you need each other. But when that opportunity arises to be able to talk about those things and potentially 
it might lead to a blue it might lead to a you know an altercation between the guys and if you remember it's it probably just transports um well at least in my case transports me back to being on the cqb and you're you're fighting each other some of your best mates that you're going to be going potentially going on operations with and you, you're hurting each other and they're hurting you but then once it's done like i mentioned it's it's done it's dead and buried you can have a talk about it you're sitting next to each other at the mess and you're having a laugh because it's all done it's been able to clear out i'm not advocating and supporting and encouraging violence and fighting and all that sort of stuff but sometimes that might happen and it's not that we're trying to lead to that but it gives an opportunity come trying to come back on track here it gives an opportunity to be able to vent maybe for want of a better term and to have those conversations with people that might have annoyed you on that operational task and some places i'm pretty sure um so reconnecting with some former uh regiment guys from the uk and and from australia and in and in nz as well some of those areas or some of them might call them a wet debrief what they mean by that is well they're getting out and having a few drinks not necessarily going out on the town but more than likely on base few drinks there in the company of the people that you've been on task and operation with and you're able to speak about whatever it is that might be frustrating you annoying you or that might be triggering you or that you might be worried about before you go home sort of thing and so those moments and opportunities are really helpful for operators when they get back to have that opportunity to decompress a little bit and to talk with the guys that they've been on task or patrol with and to just let stuff out sometimes from experience and seeing some of those things sometimes guys are bottling and carrying things that you didn't realize or that you didn't give a second thought because everybody views things differently and and takes things differently and i think i touched on an aspect with bill where i was really quite anti a couple of people that put in a claim for ptsd or post-traumatic stress and my view and why i got quite upset were annoyed with those people and quite judgmental of them was because they weren't at the front line they were back at a ford operating base for most of the time and if not all the time and i just thought how cheeky is that to be doing that but i you know as dion jensen mentioned trauma is trauma and it doesn't matter where it happens and how it happens and all that sort of thing if it affects you it's you know it affects you just because what they've looked at might not affect me or might not affect the person next to me doesn't mean that it's not real and that it's not traumatic and that it hasn't caused uh, that psychological scarring or whatever it's called to that person so there's been a bit of a give myself 10 good uppercuts and wake up to myself sort of thing so that opportunity coming back again to be able to sit down and talk through things and about things or talk with each other is a key part of what I've taken away through my conversations with former members and to put another lens on it for you um, without harping on too much and delving into any further detail. So I just want to try to put that on the table in, um, in concert with what Bill has spoken about and correctly spoken about um, and just to acknowledge, not to make an excuse, not to try to cover anything up, but to present a couple of pieces of information through a, a few different lenses and some of those conversations have been quite in depth with my brothers who have shared their thoughts and stuff about that and um, and they mentioned to me they said man it would have been good if you had have spoken about you know some of these aspects about these debriefs that happen and why sometimes that transition before heading back home is important and they're absolutely right I should have and I didn't but here's an opportunity and here's an update which I, I'm chucking in here now. So take it for what it's worth and hopefully if it helps you have a maybe a slightly better view or a slightly different take on the value and benefit of that sort of stuff happening, then that's a good thing because there is a lot of value and benefit as to why that happens. It's not to those that shared their, their honest thoughts and opinions with me and thank you for that but it's to those people it's not about guys coming back getting on the lash and then going out and mucking around 
on their spouses or partners. It's not about that at all. <clears throat> so, yeah, there's a lot of uh, baggage. There's a lot of heavy hearts and minds that come back from tasks and operations at times. People think that Special Forces operators are a superhuman, I think, in some, in many respects, probably not so much now because there's so much more content and information that's out there in relation to um, very strong and capable individuals who have served in those Tier 1 Special Forces units and, and other Special Forces units around the world. And you see the human side of those individuals and what they've been able to do and or what they've been struggling with. And so that's to give you the uh, the other lens of that or another lens of that. Finally, the last part I've got, 25 minutes, so doing good for time, is upcoming guests. So I spoke about Philip Tolele. He's uh, he's coming, well, I've already done his one. Brian wasn't able to join in on that one, but he'll be coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks. So he'll have two weeks sort of back to back. Mm, yeah, probably back to back. And uh, I'm really excited. Let me just grab um, this. Well, Brian and I are both super excited. So I'm getting to reconnect with a very good friend of mine and probably known to a number of former um, SAS operators um, by the name of a gentleman by the name of Des Powell. So the first name at the top there. Co authored this book, Bravo 30, with Damien Lewis, uh, who I've not yet had the privilege to meet, but he's highly, very well respected. Um, author and uh, a trusted author, especially when it comes to talking about things related to the Special Air Service. And he's authored uh, a number of other books on the back here. At the bottom, sorry, you won't be able to, might not be able to see all of those. I'll put it closer to the camera. Gives you a little bit of a look. Damien Lewis, legend of a guy. I've only spoken to him on WhatsApp, but caught up with Des. So those uh, guys that know Des, awesome guy, X22, SAS Bravo 30. Obviously, not a lot of people uh, know or knew that there were three Bravo patrols during the 19, 1991 Gulf War. The most well known one is Bravo 20, and the patrol commander Andy McNabb, who put out his book and his account of what happened uh, to the Bravo 20 patrol. Well, there was Bravo 10 also, as well, and Bravo 30, which is the patrol that Des was in. And my good friend Des, he was actually originally penciled or not penciled uh, written down to be part of Bravo 20 and then a few bunch uh, a whole bunch of things changed which is all documented in the book so his book has been cleared by the MOD he's going to be on the podcast next week really excited and looking forward to having Des on there uh, he is a cracker he is very very English but he is he is a legend he's a champion if you can get past that Yorkshire accent that he has he's a very very funny guy as he mentions uh, he had he contracted COVID as well not too long ago and I just spoke with him a couple of days ago and he said he ended up losing his ability to speak which he said as you know as you know Joe, that's 50% of my capability so I cracked up because I realized how hard that would have been for him so that's what I mean this is going to be a bit of a challenge for us but he's really on board we said we're going to try to stick to the hour and uh, We've got a bit of a structure. He's happy to try to stick to that. And we'll have him on multiple times when he's available to continue to share his experiences and particularly talk about his book. This is an awesome book. Uh, this is the first book, military book, that I've read cover to cover for those that, <laughs> that I've never been a big reader in the first place. But this is the first book that I've read cover to cover, uh, primarily because... I wasn't interested in reading when I was coming through the military. Bravo 20 was all the rage. I wasn't interested in reading that. I, I've never read it. Um, but when I heard that my good friend had written the book and it was Bravo 30, I grabbed it straight away, went out, purchased it, and read it and loved it. Um, found it quite difficult to put it down, which is not normal for me. So anyway, read that book and also... Sorry, shout out to, uh, this book's already out, but Harry Moff has 11 Bats book. So, legend of a guy, um, making my way through that. So, just chipping my way through that at the moment. Uh, have only started, and I only just finished Dez's book last night. So, stay tuned for Dez Powell, everybody. Um, having him come on the podcast and sharing a few bits and pieces and having, no doubt, a number of laughs with him, at him, at myself, 
uh, along the way. So just to clarify, I had the privilege to work with Des in the private security sector. So not whilst uh, he was serving in the regiment or whilst I was serving in the Australian regiment, but uh, once we were out and in the private sector. So an awesome guy. I got to work with him for a number of years and, and learn from him and uh, have a laugh with him along the way. So that's about it. That's about all for this update. Uh, excited by that and having these people continue to come on. The one last final piece that I want to share just on 30 minutes now is that we've had a lot of requests for the um, NZ to have more NZ, uh, former NZ SAS operators. <clears throat> still working, still working on that one and trying um, and reaching out to people. But uh, for, you know, here in NZ, it's, it's a little different to the other special uh, to the other special forces units around the world and and that's okay um, they're not as uh, whether they're even if they're former members just for your information without delving into too much detail they're um, not that they're not as open they're very open they're just not as at this stage not as willing to want to come forward for whatever those reasons are and I 100% respect them so that challenge is going to be there, but I already anticipated and expected that that would more than likely be the case. So unfortunate, well, not unfortunately. In the meantime, it is what it is. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. The podcast is going to be here. The invitations that I've extended to former members of the unit is an open invitation one. And whether or not those individuals want to take me up or take Brian and I up on the offer is the ball is in their court. So we're going to keep punching on doing what we're doing, trying to share with you information, content and having these special guests that are willing to come on and um, share a little bit about themselves, uh, whether it's some of the mistakes that they've made, whether it's about the successes that they've had, whether it's about the things that they're doing now. All of that stuff we want to continue or we're going to continue to do that with the intent of trying to help others along the way. So for what it's worth, as we go along, we apologize or I apologize um, in advance if you're not getting what it is or if you feel like your requests aren't being heard or listened to. Know that I'm working pretty hard to try to get more uh, NZ, uh, former NZ guys on. Uh, it's just slow going at the moment and we've just got to respect that like I've got to respect them and, and I do. So it is what it is and we'll... Uh, leave it at that and sign off. So thank you very much for tuning in to this solo update with myself, co-founder for the Epic Alt Outdoor Create a Better Future podcast, Joe Hortai, and on behalf of my co-founding partner, Mr. Brian Osmacron Osman, he sends his regards and his apologies for not being able to be here on this particular update. So take care, stay awesome, and as always, as we sign off with this particular series, Who Dares Wins. <laughs>